With us today from Washington, D.C., are two members of the United States Senate who are becoming increasingly influential in national farm and food policy legislation. They are Senator George McGovern of South Dakota and Senator Gail McGee of Wyoming. Senator McGovern is a member of the Senate Agriculture Committee. In 1961 and 1962, he was President John F. Kennedy's Food for Peace Director. He was elected to the Senate in 1963, and last year was the author of the Voluntary Wheat Certificate Plan, which was incorporated in the Wheat Cotton Bill and enacted into law. Senator McGovern was floor manager for the important farm legislation when it came up for passage, although it was his first Congress as a member of the United States Senate. Senator Gail McGee of Wyoming is a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee and author of legislation which established the National Food Marketing Commission. The commission is currently holding hearings on how our food marketing system is working. Several economic studies of its operation are now underway. Senator McGee is a member of the commission and will discuss its work with us. And here to open today's program is Senator McGovern. Gail, my uh, correspondence, and I expect uh, yours is somewhat uh, similar, indicates a considerable amount of concern on the part of farm operators and ranchers as to exactly what the uh, impact of the administration's farm bill will be on uh, agricultural income. I think we know that uh, in recent years, net farm income has been running about a billion dollars a year above the uh, level of 1960. But unfortunately, that uh, income improvement uh, is not uh, continuing. It's more or less uh, stagnant at a time when costs of uh, farmers and ranchers are on the increase. I think the best thing to be said for that income, George, is that it now totals about the same as the income of General Motors. That's all the farmers in the United States. That's a, that's a striking way to, to put it. But the result of this uh, situation of a more or less uh, stagnant uh, gross income at a time when costs of farmers and ranchers are on the increase is that about 90 to 100,000 farm families are disappearing from the land every year. In my state, for example, between the 1950 and 1960 census, we lost 10,000 uh, farm families for an average of about 1,000 a year. We know that uh, many farm families are going deeper into debt uh, every year. And unless uh, something can be done to improve uh, farm income very substantially, I suspect that we will see a continuance of this migration from the farm and the ranch uh, into, the, into the towns and cities. It's true that uh, we've had some uh, general improvement in some uh, sectors of our uh, agricultural economy, but if you take the uh, uh, farm economy as a whole, over the last 15 years, we've had a slide off of about one-third uh, in farm income, while the income of the nation as a whole has gone up uh, somewhere around 80 percent. Now, in my talks in uh, cities, and I know you've been uh, doing the same thing because you're very much in demand as a speaker around over the country, I've been stressing the fact that uh, the agricultural problem is not one for farmers alone, it's one that the whole country ought to be uh, deeply concerned about. Actually, about half of the unemployment in the cities uh, stems directly or indirectly from rural people being forced off the land and going into the cities to uh, look for jobs that are in uh, short supply. Well, one of the curious aspects of that, George, is that uh, we hear our people talking about the farmer and the consumer as though the farmer himself wasn't a consumer or as though he wasn't people. I, and uh, it, it's, it's this separation of the farmer from uh, the real complex of, of uh, Amer the American people that is a very disturbing thing. It surely is. I, I told a, a group of people in Boston the other day that we've had a kind of a cold war going on for a long uh, period of time between the city uh, dweller on one hand and the uh, farmer on the other, whereas the facts are that their interests are the same. Whatever improves farm income is definitely going to help our uh, city uh, producers, our businessmen, and those who uh, produce for the farm uh, market. Now, the agricultural bill that uh, is now pending uh, before the Congress will make what I think is a uh, valuable contribution to improving farm income, and yet I'm not fully satisfied with that bill in its uh, present form. As near as I can estimate, it might uh, 
add somewhere around $250 million annually to farm income, which is a, a precious... Uh, that's, that's pretty small. It's a very small, small increase in terms, of, in terms of the problem. Particularly in a country that's talking about a gross national product that's jumping by the billions. Exactly. Not by the millions. Exactly. The, uh, the wheat aspects of that uh, bill do represent uh, a small improvement over the uh, existing program. Under the terms of the legislation as it now stands, uh, we would add about $250 million to the uh, income of our wheat farmers, but we would then take away about $125 million of that by eliminating the so-called export certificate on wheat. Uh, this still leaves the farmers with a net gain of $125 million, but as you say, that's a very, a very small amount in terms of uh, uh, what needs to be done. Now, I'm hopeful that when this legislation comes before the uh, Agricultural Committee and on the floor of the uh, Senate, uh, that we can do two things to produce it, to improve it. Number one, that we'll be able to hold on to the export uh, certificates. And number uh, two, that we can make the 100% uh, parity uh, certificate on domestic uh, food wheat a mandatory uh, uh, provision. I do think we need to strengthen that bill. As you know, there are some other features of the legislation. It will bring about a modest increase in income for rice and wool and feed grain uh, producers. Well, I think that the, uh, you've put this in the, in the right order or the right uh, priority sequence. You suggest to us that we ought to put our concern, first of all, on the farmer and his survival and give secondary consideration then to the uh, great concern that's expressed over costs, what it's costing. Uh, there are those that so, uh, get so obsessed with the cost figures that they forget about the people involved. And the cost figures, it seems to me, have to be kept in the perspective of importance, and I think people are still impo more important than numbers. I couldn't agree more, uh, Gail. I, I think, too, sometimes farm program costs that are blamed on uh, farmers actually represent items that are invested in the economy as a whole. And you consider the, the school lunch program and the forest service and many of these other things that go into the agricultural budget, those are actually benefits for the whole country, not for farmers alone. Well, there's one aspect of the administration's farm bill that I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about. Uh, in that bill, as you know, uh, it proposes to use a voluntary certificate plan for rice. Now, you were the author of the original voluntary certificate program. And what do you think about extending it to, a, to another commodity? Well, I think it would work very well in the, uh, in the case of uh, rice, uh, Gail. I, I feel, however, that it would be difficult to use the uh, uh, two-price uh, plan or the certificate plan on feed grains because so much of our uh, feed grains are not uh, marketed but are consumed on the farm and used in the uh, production of hogs and, uh, and cattle. So it would doubtless be very difficult to apply the uh, certificate principle to feed grains. The, uh, uh, the consumer, I suppose, is, is worried about this in a, in a way. Uh, are you getting many objections to the prospect for an increase? I, I understand that increase is, what, a dollar and a half, dollar seventy-five it'll, it'll run a the, year? It'll run the certificate up to uh, a, dollar and a, a dollar and a quarter on the so-called domestic food wheat. In other words, mm -hmm. the wheat that we use for bread and for uh, human food purposes. So we hear home. back here that this is they're, they're really going to mobilize the consumers against this because it will add a penny or so to the cost of a loaf of bread. Well, Gail, I think that's an unfounded uh, fear. I can't recall getting a single letter from any uh, consumer group expressing opposition to this certificate payment to wheat farmers. I think most uh, consumers in this country are willing to pay a fair price to the people that give us the best and cheapest supply of food uh, in the world. Now, it's true that if we raise the certificate on wheat to a dollar and a quarter a bushel, uh, this might result in a half a cent a loaf increase in the price of bread, or maybe a cent a loaf. That means for uh, I don't know how much bread uh, you consume in the course of a year, but let's say the average person uh, uh, consumes uh, 150 loaves of bread uh, a year. That'd be a loaf for about every two days. That means it's going to cost us roughly a dollar and a half Our a half year, a half. which is a very small price to pay for prosperity uh, among our uh, wheat producers. I, the, only, the only opposition I've seen that uh, has come on this uh, level has come from one of our uh, farm organizations. There's been nothing from any of the consumer groups that I'm aware of.
Well, I think unless and until we're ready to pay the farmer a fair price for what he produces, that we're, uh, we're jeopardizing the economic base of many other segments of our, of our people. But there is another aspect of the pending legislation that's of uh, deep concern in my state. As you know, Wyoming and our area in general is heavily dependent upon livestock. And the food grain uh, provisions uh, lead to lots of questions that are raised in my mail. And uh, I was curious about what you thought the effect of the food grain program would be on uh, cattle and hogs. Well, it is true, uh, Gail, that there's a very, very close uh, relationship, and no one knows this uh, better than you, between the uh, price that feed grain producers receive and the price our livestock producers receive for their uh, cattle. Uh, there are some people who uh, feel that any shoring up or improvement of feed grain uh, prices uh, would work a hardship on the feeders, on the cattle feeders. Actually, it works the other way. Uh, a good price to the feed grain producers is one of the best guarantees we have of fair prices for our uh, hog and livestock uh, producers. There's an old uh, unwritten rule that cheap feed means cheap cattle and hogs. You can't have a strong livestock industry based on cheap feed. So I think to the extent that this measure uh, continues our existing uh, feed grain program and attempts to uh, hold feed grain prices at somewhere near a fair price, it will actually serve as a stabilizing factor uh, on the livestock industry. Now there are a couple of things about this feed grain bill that I'm a little bit concerned about. One is the uh, suggestion that some of the diverted acres uh, might be planted to soybeans, and the other provision opening up diverted acres for uh, grazing purposes. I think the Congress will want to take a very careful look at that because uh, we certainly don't want to do anything to demoralize prices on soybeans, which have been holding uh, pretty well, and we don't want to open up a lot of land to grazing in such a way as to drive down the price of our, of our uh, livestock producers. By and large, though, I, th I think this bill uh, contains features that are a real benefit uh, to the livestock industry. Well, I know that one of the uh, inroads that we've made successfully in the, in the farm program has been on the problem of big surplus stocks. And uh, hog production, uh, I think, is off this year, and hog prices have uh, improved a little bit. Cattle prices are recovering somewhat. It's quite a different cattle price structure this year compared to a year ago about now, and that was due in no small way to the aggressive program of the Department of Agriculture and moving into the surplus stock field in an attempt to, to level it off a bit. Well, actually, Gail, we've been very successful in pulling down our uh, surplus stocks. We've reduced uh, wheat surpluses, for example, about a half a billion uh, bushels. We're down to a level now that's just barely above what we need for uh, a reserve. I personally would like to see our wheat and feed grain stocks come down a little more, but uh, we have made great progress and I would say have eliminated the bulk of the uh, surplus. And of course that's a great advantage to our producers. It takes these uh, price depressing surpluses off the market. We've moved them into export channels. We've moved them into our Food for Peace uh, program and we're using them uh, very effectively in the war against uh, hunger, uh, both here at home uh, and abroad. Now, one thing the administration has attempted to do in recent uh, years is to use its own surplus stocks in such a way as to hold down uh, uh, prices in the market as a means of discouraging the non-compliers. In other words, the administration has been reluctant to reward the non-compliers by shoring up market prices too much. But by the use of these export, or rather the use of these certificates, making the program attractive to compliers on a voluntary basis, I think we can uh, avoid some of these other techniques. Now, as you know, Gail, I've been uh, interested, very much interested, in our food uh, marketing uh, system, what uh, President Johnson referred to here some time ago as uh, market uh, power. I've been especially concerned about the possible threat to our economy and to our farm and ranch uh, producers from vertical uh, integration, because I think anything that introduces monopoly uh, practice into the uh, food producing industry uh, could be a threat to both 
consumers and producers. You've done a, a tremendous service, in my judgment, both for farmers, for ranchers, and for uh, consumers by the bill that you uh, authored and directed through to passage, uh, setting up a food marketing commission on which you now uh, serve. I'm sure everyone is uh, interested in what that commission's been doing. Well, let me, let me quickly add that you were one of those on the floor of the Senate instrumental in, in helping us guide that through to successful passage. And the commission is now uh, under full steam, as it were, and we're running into some very interesting things. The reason for the commission really stems from the problem of the prices that the farmer receives or doesn't receive for what he, what he produces. Our concern was triggered by the obvious fact of the last 15 years, that the farmer receives less and less for what he grows while the consumer pays more and more. Since 1950, uh, what the farmer receives has actually dropped 12%. What the housewife pays has actually risen 29 or 30%. And we want to know why that spread. And so we've been striving to get at the answers. Nobody has any prejudgments on this. I remember you saying on the Senate floor, uh, Gail, uh, during the very depressed condition of our livestock uh, markets here a year ago that uh, there would be some consolation out of all of this if the uh, livestock producer at least had the knowledge that as a result of his pain and his low prices the housewife was able to secure meat at a lower price but that hasn't been the case. No, the, the, the livestock man doesn't worry about low prices to the housewife. Mm -hmm. He worries about her having to pay more and thus her being able to buy less of his product. And therefore, he hopes the housewife sees the other side of it, too. If he can't stay in business, she's going to forfeit her right to a free market in setting a more reasonable price for what she has to buy. The, uh, the hearings that we've held until now have, have been very, very revealing to us. We, have, we opened the national hearings of the Food Commission in Cheyenne, where we concentrated on cattle prices and the cattle marketing practices of the large food chains. And what they showed us was rather elementary, and it's been educational to the mem all of us on the commission. And that is that whenever there is a rising cost for anybody along the production line in, in livestock, there's no place to absorb that rising cost until now except to pass it downward. That means that when the food chain uh, uh, buys it, if their costs go up, rather than pay the uh, packer more, uh, they pay him the same, and the packer has to make up the difference by passing his loss down to the feedlot operator. The feedlot operator has testified before us that he can't pass it up because the packer won't take it, who says that the chain store won't take it, so he passes it down to the cattleman. And the cattleman has no way to pass it. All he can do is pass out of business. And this has been the clear direction of the policy structure in the hearings until now. We've got to come up with a formula. We have to come up with a way in which we can pass upward the rising cost of staying in business. And this has been one of the very revealing disclosures in the course of the hearings until now. Well, that's a, that's a, a fascinating uh, a report on the, on the activities of that uh, commission. I know we've had uh, alarm expressed in correspondence that's come into our uh, office, not only from our uh, livestock uh, producers, but uh, from many of our, uh, our feeders and our, our uh, uh, livestock uh, commission people. The whole industry seems to be concerned. Even the packers are concerned about this uh, trend towards uh, integration uh, that threatens to destroy what we thought of traditionally as free enterprise in the, in the livestock industry. Well, what, to what it really comes down to, we had disclosed in another way in the hearings here in Washington where we had all of the large food chains in to testify. And this centered around the, the testimony of the Federal Trade Commission that disclosed that the marketing power, the buying power of the large chains has become so considerable that they, in effect, set the price. Any, uh, the, the upshot of it is that the law of supply and demand has been repealed. That the prices, it's, it's what some call administered prices. The prices are set at the top. They're not responsive to supply and demand. They're not uh, responsive necessarily to, to cost. 
They're responsive to what the few large marketers at the top are willing to pay, and then it creates ripples downward from that point onward. Gail, will, they, will the uh, commission, that is the Food uh, Investigation Commission on which you're serving, will they be holding additional uh, hearings and go, getting out into the field, or what? what is the plan? We have a series now of uh, a dozen or more public hearings that are being held across the country. We've had another hearing on cattle in Fort Worth. We've just come back from a hearing in uh, Georgia on poultry. We're going into some states on dairy products, to others on baking goods and to uh, others on fruit and vegetables mm -hmm. so that we can get the whole uh, panorama of the marketing problems but already they're beginning to assume a pattern and whether it be in livestock or in dairy produce or in uh, uh, poultry mm -hmm. or in fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. the same pattern seems to exist namely that the rising costs of doing business in this modern day are absorbed at the bottom by the producer and this is more notably so among those in the farm community who produce perishables. That is, those where the time factor becomes an element in getting rid of, of whatever their supply is at that time. And that the large purchasers at the top, namely the food chains, have acquired an advantage in bargaining position so that they can fix a price and get it from a man whose uh, heifers are, have to go to market or he's going to lose money on them or whose turkeys have to be sold or they're going to lose the peak of the, let's say, the, the Thanksgiving or the Christmas season, or whose vegetables are going to spoil if they aren't picked up within a matter of hours. The purchaser is able to exploit the vulnerable position of the producer. And it's this that we have to try to work out some kind of a solution to by establishing an equitable bargaining position for the farmer at the beginning end of this long line that reaches the consumer. Well, I'm sure the whole uh, country is going to be uh, watching the effort to your commission with great uh, interest. We've got the greatest uh, food marketing system uh, in the world here, and we want to keep it that way, and we want to correct any of the inequities or deficiencies that creep into it. If I may uh, change the uh, subject now, uh, Gail, for a few moments, uh, there's one problem that I think we're going to have to uh, look ahead to in terms of how we use the enormous um, productive capacity that we uh, have in this country. It's quite clear that we uh, live in a world where the growth in population is outstripping the capacity of many countries uh, to meet that increase in, in population. That's especially true in Asia and Africa and Latin America where you have a rapidly growing uh, human population, but you're not increasing the uh, 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 land that can be cultivated very much. As a so matter of fact, I just saw the report from a group meeting in Kansas City the past few days in which uh, they disclose that actually in India and China in particular, they're running behind. Each day they're further behind than the day before in meeting the food problems of their own population. That's literally true. They're, they're really not uh, even keeping pace with the uh, per capita uh, increase in, um, in population. That is, the per capita food production is not keeping pace with the... Uh, well, in the Soviet Union, I, I think it's true, isn't it? Their problem is too little. Not too much. They, they haven't been plagued with the question of surpluses. I That's never can fail to reflect that if we have to have problems, I'd rather be worrying about too much than too little. Exactly. Now, uh, recognizing that uh, situation, if we look down the road a piece, I think we can see the day when our own surpluses may be uh, running out. We referred here a while ago to the fact that wheat stocks have come down a half a billion bushels and we're very little above what we need for our own uh, reserve supply today. We're, all, we're also limited by the uh, legislation under which we now uh, operate so that our overseas uh, Food for Peace administrators have to rely almost entirely on those commodities that we happen to have in surplus at any given time. If we run out of milk, we have to cut off our overseas uh, school milk program. If we run out of uh, rice or run out of uh, cornmeal or whatever the case might be, we may have to have an abrupt curtailment of our overseas aid program. Now, it's my hope that the Congress will begin thinking in terms of encouraging uh, the production of some items that we need for, frankly, humanitarian purposes to deal with this problem of hunger uh, overseas. And I, I hope we can get started at uh, 
uh, deliberate food buying in our in some of our food aid uh, programs, some of our foreign aid programs, in the same sense that we make available uh, important uh, commodities that are needed for industry overseas and needed by the military overseas, I think it's unthinkable that we would terminate food aid uh, merely because we didn't happen to have uh, surpluses on stock at any given time. Well, I couldn't agree with you more on that. I, I know of no more uh, notable and uh, spiritually satisfy satisfying war to wage than the war against hunger and malnutrition, starvation. And, and the whole world is the, is the target for that. Uh, it's an area that I trust we won't neglect in our deep concern with, uh, let's say, military aspects of the problem around the world and trying to restore uh, some kind of balance around the globe, that we not forget that one of the greatest articles of, of influence and penetration and humanitarian contribution in our entire arsenal is that of our capability of producing an abundance of food for all. And I think this is the kind of record our country can be proud to write and that the judgment of history would, uh, would uh, be filled with accolades for any nation that could share its abundance with those who need it around the world. But uh, in, in as much as we do agree on that, perhaps we could shift to another area of the legislative mill uh, where I, I, I would like a little more information. Uh, you mentioned just a moment ago uh, milk. Now, there's nothing in the Farm Bill, as far as I know, uh, for dairying. I understand that there may be a Class I quota provision so producers in milk order areas can cut production without losing any of their high value. Well, that's about all that uh, has been proposed by the administration in the field of dairying uh, this year, Gail, for the simple reason that our uh, dairy producers across the country have not agreed on a more uh, far-reaching uh, program. Neither do we have any uh, consensus among uh, poultry and egg producers as to, as to whether or not they want a particular uh, government uh, program or a control uh, program. And of course, in the absence of strong grassroots uh, support for commodity programs, uh, the Congress simply doesn't act. Well, I believe our, uh, our time is uh, just about up, uh, Gail. I want to say that it's always profitable to me to discuss uh, agricultural matters and other uh, uh, issues with you. There's no one in the uh, Congress that's any more devoted to the best interests of our uh, rural people, and I especially appreciated your comments on the Food Marketing Commission. Well, it's, it's always uh, good fun to be on the show with you, George. Uh, you're still my leader on the on, on farm problem. We were just talking about milk. We don't have much dairying in Wyoming, but we think that what's good for the dairy farmer is also good for the livestock producer or the wheat farmer or the beet farmer or the bean farmer, and that therefore we've got to look at the farm problem as a whole and not in segments. We all must stand together as we seek a solution to this question. I think it's very true, and I, I hope more and more that people all across the country will see the problems of the farmer as a problem for all Americans.